This is a really nice paper um, that Dan and his co-authors have come up with. And it starts with this clever idea that it's not just wealth in retirement that's going to determine your behavior and your spend down and so forth, but it's this balance between annuities and other financial assets that matter. So I think it's a really good paper to start this conference with because it sort of lays out the groundwork for lots of the research topics that most of us here have been working on for a very long time. So the bequest motive, is there a bequest motive? This is what I sort of, my first job as an economist was working for Mike on, this, on his um, bequest paper. Uh, we risk of outliving assets, uh, um, medical. So if we look at why the elderly don't just save after retirement. We talk about a bequest motive. We talk about the risk of outliving their assets. They want to hold on to things. They're afraid of losing it. Or the risk of medical care costs at the end of life these high expenditures. And Dan talked about widows and looks at just sort of single folks in his sample. And one of the problems when you talk about sort of the single elderly is they tend to be widows. And they may be low income and poor because they've had out of pocket medical expenses for their deceased spouse at the end of life when expenses are high. The other puzzle in this literature is why don't the elderly fully insure? Why don't they annuitize their wealth, sort of insure against outliving their assets? And we see examples after examples, and lots of these are things that are going to be talked about here today in the conference, about delaying Social Security. You can buy sort of a bigger annuity at actuarially fair rates if you delay your take-up of Social Security. People tend to, even if they have a defined benefit pension plan that provides this annuity, they cash those out when given the opportunity. So again, they're foregoing an annuity that tends to be for actuarially fair. They don't take advantage of things like reverse annuity mortgages that let them spend down their housing wealth. We also see they don't purchase long-term care insurance, another way to insure against those end-of-life out-of-pocket expenses. And for the non-elderly, they don't buy things like disability insurance. So we have several puzzles sort of nested in here. This, why don't people just save? Why don't they fully insure? Um, so forth. And why don't they annuitize their wealth? People talk about loads on the annuity policies, uh, on life expectancy. People who buy annuities tend to live much longer. So for many, it's not an actuarially fair insurance contract. There is lack of indexa indexation of most annuities. They're written in nominal terms, and so you can lose in real terms. Lots of pensions are like that. They may want to leave bequests to their children, so they don't want to annuitize their wealth. And then there's this whole psychological aspect. If you look at annuity contracts, right, you're supposed to be guarding against outliving your assets. But if you die early, you sort of lose in that context. And people somehow think that's unfair. You know, I bought this annuity. If I only live for two or three years, I'm not getting my money back. Now, people don't expect to get their money back on their car insurance. They don't want a car accident. But here, they're very worried about not getting their money back. So one of the most commonly purchased annuities are these period certain annuities. So people want to make sure they're getting 10 years of payments, even if they die earlier. So there's a lot of this sort of psychological evidence going on. In some sense, this is you're insuring against a good outcome. Usually we think of insurance as a bad outcome. So you pay your premiums. If the fire doesn't happen, the car accident doesn't happen, you're kind of happy. And so you lost those premiums. That's OK. Here you're insuring against the good outcome. You want to live long. So if the bad outcome happens and you die early and you've paid, to die early, it somehow seems unfair. So why don't people purchase long-term care insurance? A misunderstanding of Medicare rules. People might think Medicare covers it. This counterparty risk, the insurance company might not be around to pay. You buy this policy when you're 50. When you're 80 and need long-term care, are they still going to be there? Are they going to raise your premiums? Um, you might want to remain at home. If you buy a long-term care insurance policy, it lowers the cost, perhaps to zero, of going into a nursing home. So if you're hoping your children take care of you and you can stay in your own home, you don't want to buy this policy that makes it too easy to move into a nursing home. Um, and then state-dependent utility, which I'll talk a bit about that later. You might not value consumption in the sick state when you're in a nursing home as much as you value it when you're healthy. And Dan was using the other argument that your marginal utility income is higher in the sick state. And we'll come back to that. So they, what they do in this paper is they come up with this nice tractable model that reconciles a lot of these puzzles 
in a very simple way. Basically, with the presence of Medicaid, that's the main driver of this, and annuities, you can get lots of, you can get this lack of spending down and so forth. You don't need to worry about long-term care insurance. You don't need to worry about bequest motives or all those other risks. So it, it comes out with a very common sense uh, solution, which is nice. High annuity individuals will self-insure. If your annuity is going to cover the cost of your long-term care, then that, that works for you. You can keep saving in retirement because you'll consume it later. But if you have a low annuity, you're a low annuity person, anything you save is basically going to get taxed away. And that annuity itself is sort of wasted. You're going to pay part of it, the nursing home cost with your annuity, and then Medicare is going to top it up to whatever the cost of the nursing home is. If you had a smaller annuity, Medicare would pay more. So it, as long as your annuity is below the cost of the nursing home and you go into a nursing home, you're getting really nothing back from it in some sense. So this, it makes perfect sense, which is nice to see a model that you can estimate that's tractable that comes out with these predictions that we all think are fairly intuitive. Um, one of the interesting things about it is this result suggests that additional annuitization to find benefit pension plans and so forth can actually be really costly to low-income individuals. They're not getting to spend that money. In some sense, it's getting wasted for them. Um, so let me talk about several extensions and what this basic framework can be used to look at. Uh, one of the asked things is if low health, falling into this low health, poor health, going to a nursing home, that's not an absorbing state. If you can leave a nursing home, then annuities have value because you can spend down all your wealth paying the nursing homes through medically needy programs the um, government will chip in, pay whatever you need to make the cost of a nursing home when you run out of money. But if you leave and go back to the community, if you only had liquid assets, they're all gone. You have nothing left. If you have an annuity, that annuity keeps paying. So that's sort of a, re a reason to annuitize if you think that you can come out of that nursing home someday. If you're going to be in there for three years or so, somehow get better or a shorter stay, it provides extra value for an annuity. Um, for many of these people, housing com uh, comprises the majority of the wealth. Housing's not easily spent down. It's a lumpy asset. You either get rid of it or you keep it. People don't use re uh, reverse annuity mortgages. That's something you can claim. Few people have annuity income sufficient to cover the cost of private long-term care. If you think of the Medicaid value of a nursing home, you were using 56000 or something like that. If you go out on your own to try to purchase a stay in a nursing home, it's $80,000, $90,000 a year. So most people aren't going to have annuity income equal to that. Um, family is really important, adding bequest motives, um, care from children, transfers to children. When I started looking at long-term care, it was in the context of transfers to your children. You might buy long-term care insurance because you want to protect your children's time. You don't want them to have to care for you. Or you might want to protect your wealth so you can leave a bequest and not spend everything on long-term care. So adding in a family could be very interesting. And then heterogeneity in the value of the bequest motive, altruism towards children, et cetera. There have also been interesting developments in the long-term care insurance market that can affect how a model is developed or so forth. They, many states now let you use Medicaid to pay for family caregivers. So you can stay in your own home, collect Medicaid, and also help your children who are caring for you, which makes it not, uh, they use the term disamenity of Medicaid. That makes it less bad. You're living in your own home, you're having help, and you're reimbursing those helpers. Uh, private long-term care insurance policies also offer the option of cash. You can buy a policy that doesn't cover, doesn't pay the nursing home, it gives you cash directly, and you use that cash for whatever you need to stay in your own home. There are now partnership plans, Medicaid partnership plans in some states that allow you to protect your assets. If you buy one of these qualified plans and spend down and um, exhaust the plan, Medicaid in that state will let you keep assets equal to the value of the plan. Uh, California and New York were a couple of the first ones. And now there are some new coupled products. You have annuities coupled with long-term care insurance, so your annuity value goes up if you need long-term care. There are life insurance that pays long-term care benefits and so forth. So there's lots of different policies. You get really fancier types of insurance going forward. And now I promise state-dependent utility. So they're looking at the uh, marginal utility income or consumption is higher 
in the sixth state. Um, this paper by um, Amy Finkelstein um, and her co-authors that say that the consumption, uh, marginal utility consumption actually declines with worse health. You're, that way you don't want to transfer health to a low state. You might not want to insure against that time. You might not want to keep an annuity. And this is work, um, Jeffrey Brown and Gopi, who's here. Uh, this is that we did a while ago. This is the marginal utility of consumption. We asked people whether they would prefer to have resources when they were healthy or when they were sick. And you can see it's split pretty evenly. There's a lot of heterogeneity. Some people value resources more when they're sick. Some people value resources more when they're healthy. And this, that, uh, the right-hand side is the fraction in each of these bars who buy long-term care insurance. So you see people react in response to this. People who value dollars or consumption more when they're sick are more likely to buy long-term care insurance which makes sense. It looks like people are being somewhat rational. The other thing we did related to this was look at differences in the marginal utility consumption by impairment. So we did a couple different things. We looked at the difference between physical health and cognitive health. So it says, consider what your life is like at 80. 50% chance you'll be healthy and independent. 50% chance you'll be in a nursing home. Um, and that your physical health will have deteriorated to the point where you have to live in a nursing home. And these are the ADLs that Dan mentioned. Or alternatively, that your mental or cognitive health has deteriorated to the point where you have to live in a nursing home. So people might have different preferences based on whether it's just a physical ailment and you can talk to people, read, enjoy life still, or whether it's a cognitive impairment. And we give them $10,000, let them put balls in urns, if anybody's seen in the American Life Panel survey, and decide how they want to split that $10,000 across a sick state or a healthy state. First, if it's a physical impairment, and secondly, if it's a cognitive impairment. And what you find is that at older ages, people prefer, on average, people prefer consumption when they're in their good health versus disabled. If you compare physical versus cognitive disabilities, Individuals are more willing to transfer resources to a low health state if it's physical rather than it's cognitive. And that sort of makes sense. If you just have, you know, you're stuck in bed, you need help dressing, bathing, or something like that, you can still enjoy a lot of things. And so you value the resources there to help you continue to enjoy life. If you're cognitively impaired, you value the resources less. We also find differences by the level of resources. Higher income people, um, they're less willing to transfer wealth to the um, low health state than low income people. We speculate this might be differences in what the consumption good actually is. If you're a high income person when you're healthy, you're doing things like traveling, going out to the theater, restaurants, and so forth. If you're a low income person, you might be sort of watching movies, things like that, that you can still do in poor health. So just to conclude, I think this paper provides a really appealing, tractable model with a really clever idea of looking at this annuity versus other types of financial wealth. And it provides a framework that allows to expand to include other aspects of decision making. All sorts of different types of heterogeneity. Heterogeneity in state dependent utility, heterogeneity in life expectancy, variation in types of long-term care insurance that they can buy, bequest motives, and as Dan said, moving to couples from just singles and those sorts of things. I think it's a fantastic baseline on which to start and which to launch the conversation over the next couple days about lots of these issues going on in retirement.